we espouse that we want to have an impact on the world to change the way leaders think. And if that's really what we espouse for ourselves, you know, and then we allow only a couple thousand people from the world every year to come here. <laughs> I, we, this is our aspiration, this is what we do. And now the technology allows us to truly do what our founders uh, thought about. It's an opportunity long before it's a threat. Few people are as revered in both academia and business as our next speaker, Dr. Clayton Christensen of the Harvard Business School. Named the most inf influential management thinker in the world in 2011 and 2013, this best-selling author of nine books and more than 100 articles is the foremost authority on innovation and growth. He actively advises numerous governments, businesses, and organizations globally on building sustainable business models. Dr. Christensen's theories have been applied to national economies, startups, and Fortune 50 companies. His profound insights have earned, earned him a number of accolades, such as five McKinsey Awards given each year for the two best articles published in the Harvard, Harvard Business Review and the Global Business Book Award for The Innovator's Dilemma. Dr. Christensen serves on the Senior Advisory Board of Academic Partnerships. Without doubt, Clay Christensen is one of the keenest observers of disruptive innovation. But above all, he is an incredible human being and a great friend. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Clayton Christensen. How are you? It's a great honor for me to be with you and to take a little bit of your time. Um, a couple of other things about you that you need to know. Um, I had a stroke a couple of years ago. A clot came from somewhere and lodged itself right here in my brain, and it killed my ability to speak. And uh, so I've been trying, learning how to speak English one word at a time. And so in my talk, um, I will say wrong things. Um, that's just because my order in my brain isn't fully restored yet. And if I pause and can't come up with the word I need, those of you on the front, if you know the word I'm looking for, just <laughs> shout it out. Um, and you'll notice that I speak to the floor. Um, and the reason is that if I look at you, you'll distract me. <laughs> and so it's not that I have become shy all of a sudden, but that's just the way I deal with things. I have a, an interesting life because I am, stand, I, I spend much of my academic life developing theories about management. And the word theory gets a bum rap with managers because it's associated with the word theoretical, which connotes impractical. But a theory is actually a statement of what causes what and why. And when you look at it from those, those lenses, Theories are very useful because they allow, allow us to sp look into the future to see things that the data won't sh allow us to see because data is only available about the past. And so that's all I do is try to develop good theories of management. And then on occasion, I am able to pick up these theories and put them on like lenses to look at what's happening in our world. And a, a nice thing about it is if somebody says, what do you think is gonna happen to my company? I will able to, I, I'm able to say, well, I actually don't have an opinion about your company, but this theory that's emerged from my research, the theory has an opinion, and the theory says you're gonna get killed. <laughs> and I could be a little bit more direct by blaming it on the theory. So what I'd like to do is just explain to you a few of the theories that have emerged from my research that have some salience, I think, to the future of universities. What I'd like to describe on this slide is that you can describe almost the history of any industry as a set of concentric circles. 
The centermost circle represents customers in an industry who have the most money and skill. And then the larger circles represent larger populations of people who don't have as much money or skill. And almost always, modern industries start in the middle uh, because the first manifestations of products are complicated and expensive. And therefore, the early users of the products are those who have enough money to afford it. Now, what I'd like to do is, in that middle circle, describe in that context a theory that we call disruption. Some of you have, been, have read more than you wish about this theory. But I'll, I'd like to go over its essence with you, because we'll then look at higher education through that lens. So we'll have on the vertical axis the performance of a product or a service over time. In every market, there are two trajectories. And the first trajectory is the tra trajectory of improvement in products and services as companies try to make better and better products. Some of the innovations that help companies move up this trajectory are just incremental year-to-year -year improvements. Others are dramatic breakthrough innovations as they, they pursue uh, better and better products. There's a second trajectory of improvement, and that is the ability of customers to use this improvement. And almost always, the trajectory of improvement outstrips the ability of customers to use the improvement. And so if you go back in time, at the beginning, products that aren't good enough for what customers need at one point are prone to overshoot what the same customers can use at a later point in time. A good way to visualize this is go back to the early 1980s when you and I were first learning how to do word processing on those early personal computers. Do you remember how often you had to stop your fingers to let the Intel 286 chip catch up to you? Because the, the world's fastest chip couldn't even keep pace with our fingers. But as Intel kept introducing faster and faster chips, now the processor in your, na your laptop is only used about to 15% of its capacity. They have way overshot what most people can utilize. And this is really quite common. As it relates to online learning, if you go back in the past, the, the quality of online learning was really not very good, even amongst the best, like the Open University. But holy cow, it is getting so good so fast that in many ways it's already overshot what most, most customers or uh, students are able to absorb. Uh, we call these innovations sustaining innovations. And a sustaining innovation is an attempt to make good products into better products that we could sell for higher profits to our best customers. Almost always, the companies that lead the industry in sustaining innovations are those who, are the, who already are the incumbent leaders. And it doesn't matter technologically how difficult it is. If the innovation will allow the leaders in the industry to make better products that they could sell for better profits to their best customers, they always figure out how to way to, a way to get it done. But there is a different type of technology that always killed the leaders. And we call these disruptive innovations. And the word disruptive in our languages has a very specific meaning. And a disruptive innovation is transforms the complicated, expensive product that exists in the middle into something that is so much more affordable and accessible that a whole new population of people have access to the technology. And we call it disruptive because instead of sustaining the trajectory in the core, it disrupts it by bringing to the market something simple and affordable. And what we found is that almost invariably, it's an entrant company that comes in with simple products and then ultimately uh, kills the leaders in the core. And I'd like to describe the process by which that occurs on the next 
slide as I go through this. Some of you might know or remember a, a company in the Boston area called Digital Equipment Corporation. And digital equipment in the 1970s and most of the 80s was the world's most admired company in all the world. And when you, you read explanations about why digital was so successful, invariably it was attributed to the brilliance of the management team. And they were very good. Then about 1988, digital equipment just fell off a cliff, began to unravel very quickly. When you then read explanations in the press about why they had stumbled so badly, always it was attributed to the ineptitude of the management team. Very same folks run in the company. And for a while, I framed it as, geez, I wonder how smart people could get so stupid so fast. And that is the common explanation that most of, most of us accept when a company stumbles. Somehow the management team had its act together at one point, but then they were out of its league at another. But the reason why the stupid management hypothesis just didn't make sense is that every mini computer company in the world collapsed in unison. They were making a product called mini computers because they were much smaller than mainframes. But every one of them collapsed in unison. Data, Data General, uh, Prime, Wang, Nixdorf, Hewlett Packard, Honeywell. And you'd expect these people to collude occasionally on setting prices, but to collude to collapse was a stretch. <laughs> And there just had to be something fundamental that caused them all to gas themselves in unison. And it turned out that this simple uh, diagram explains why that happened. So during the 19, if you could show the chart again, it's better than me. Um, during the 1980s, as the personal co computer was emerging, there were people coming into the management of digital equipment every day with ideas to invest in new products. Some of these ideas entailed making better computers than digital had ever made before. In fact, these would be so good that you just could do with, on a little computer what you formerly had to do in a big mainframe. Those promised gross margins of 60%. And on these mini computers, you could only earn 45% margins. While the management was trying to decide if they should invest to make better products, other people were coming in saying, ladies and gentlemen, you don't get it. Just go at the window and look out. Everybody's buying personal computers. In the 80s, everybody was. Well, the management would look out and say, yeah, everybody is buying personal computers, but there are a couple of other problems with that. First, do you remember how crummy the early personal computers were? In fact, Apple sold the Apple II as a toy to children. Not a single one of Digital's customers could use a personal computer for the first 10 years that they were in the market. And that meant that the more carefully they listened to their customers, they got no signal from their customers that the personal computer mattered because it didn't to them. And then when they looked at the business plans, it looked a lot worse because in the very best of years, they promised gross margins of 40%. They were headed to 20% very quickly. And you could earn those paltry percentages on computers that sold for $2,000, whereas this kind of a machine cost $250,000. So really, the choice the management had to make was, gosh, guys, I wonder if we should make better products that we could sell for better profits to our best customers. Alternatively, we could make our money making worse products that none of our customers would buy that would ruin our margins. I wonder what we should do. <laughs> and that's why it's so hard for the leaders of an industry to deal with disruption, because it makes no economic or customer sense to do so. And that's why almost always entrant companies go after what ultimately turns, turns out to be the winning uh, battle in the game. I thought I'd try to describe how this worked out in another industry in microelectronics, uh, because from this history, there are actually a lot of interesting insights 
for the future of higher education. So up until the early 1970s, most consumer electronics products were built with the vacuum tube technology. And the vacuum tubes were about the size of a child's fist. And in uh, television, again, the televisions were about roughly this size, there would be 20 to 25 vacuum tubes in it. And it was complicated technology, and they generated a lot of heat, and they used a lot of power. And every year, two or three of the vacuum tubes would break in your TV, and so you had to hire a, uh, a, a repairman to come and figure out which one had broken and fix it and so on. So they were complicated and expensive. Uh, in today's dollars, a television cost about $4,000. So you had to be rich, and it had to, it had to have a pretty big uh, living room to, to put this, uh, this machine in. The transistor was a disruptive technology because it couldn't handle the power that would be required to be used in that product. And everybody knew that it was important. So the vacuum tube companies, all of them, took a license to the transistor from Bell Labs. They took the license into their own labs and framed it as a technological problem. In other words, we can't use uh, transistors until it's good enough to handle the power required in the applications. Today, at today's money, the vacuum tube companies spend over three billion dollars trying to make the transistor good enough that it could be used in their market. While they were uh, working on the technology, out here, competing against non-consumption, meaning a product that is so simple and affordable that a whole new population of people have access to it. The first application for the transistor in 1951 was a hearing aid, but then it really started to hit the mainstream in 1955 when Sony introduced the world's first pocket radio. I don't know how many of you have enough gray hair to remember the, that Sony pocket radio. It cost two bucks. You could stick it right there. It was uh, battery powered, and it had a horrible sound. <laughs> but Sony sold it to the rebar of humanity, people we call teenagers today. And the teenagers were delighted with the crummy product because it was infinitely better than nothing, which was their other alternative. And m my brother and I bought one. Each pitched in a dollar. And before that, our mother had us right under her thumb because we had only one radio in the home and it it's, uh, emitted uh, uh, classic music. And this allowed us to go outside of the, ins the earshot, earshot of our mother and we could listen to rock and roll. Then in 1959, introduced the, introduced the first portable television Again, it was a very limited product, but by making it so affordable and accessible, a whole new population of people who couldn't afford one of those could have one of these. And because it was infinitely better than nothing, customers would just love the product. And so through the 1950s and then into the 60s, a booming new market emerged on the periphery of the market and the people in the middle, like RCA, felt no pain because these are all uh, customers that they didn't serve anyway. But out here, Sony and Panasonic just made the product better and better and better. Until by the mid-1980s, you could start to build pretty big things with, with uh, solid-state electronics. And one by one, it sucked the customers out of the core into the periphery, and the periphery then became the core. All of the companies that made vacuum tube products vaporized, every one of them. That's kind of, it's kind of a sad story, isn't it? Because it's not that the vacuum tube companies didn't see the transistor coming. Uh, it's not that they weren't courageous or committed. They spent easily 30 times more money 
trying to make the transistor to work in the market they, that they served, rather than 30 times more money than Sony spent. But what's the sad thing is that they didn't realize that there was non-consumption in their market. It's really easy to see consumption, but non-consumption typically is a bigger market than is consumption. And when the people in the core vacuum, vac vacuum world, they look at the opportunity to invest, it looked like investing in the core business was where the money would be. Because it's hard, not, it's hard to see non-consumption unless you know what you need to look for. Uh, I'll just give you a silly example uh, that's going on right now. There is an enormous amount of non-consumption of art. Um, and a student of mine is starting a company to address the non-consumption of art. And what we mean by non-consumption of art is most of us might have a lovely mu uh, museum in our cities and go there once or twice a year. And then when we buy a home or an apartment, we look at this blank wall and we say we need a piece of art and you get it and you stick it there. And after it's been on, the, for the first three weeks that it's on on the wall, you consume art. But then you become so accustomed to having a piece there that you don't consume art anymore. You don't, you don't notice art. And yet it, it occupies that place. And so you tend not to buy something else to put in its place and consume art. I hope this makes sense to you. So my student has this business where what you buy is a flat screen, flat screen TV, a high definition screen, and it's bordered with a beautiful uh, frame. And every three weeks, you get a new piece of art. And uh, if you don't like that piece of art, you can get another art, uh, another piece. Uh, you can see um, museums just there in your home and realize that there is an, a, a huge amount of non-consumption of art. And that's what was going on here. They couldn't see the non-consumption. In a similar way, it's so easy for us at our universities, we're surrounded with consumption, but we don't see all of the non-consumption of learning that exists. We have not been able to access that because we don't see it. And yet online learning, starting in the periphery, competes against non-consumption. And so we feel, just like the uh, vacuum tube companies, we feel comfortable with how things are. But I think the reason why we're all here is to realize that the world is changing. A couple of other points. You notice on the green axis, I've written there the, 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 the different, the di there's a different dimension or different definition of performance. In the back, the way my mother measured the quality of the sound was the fidelity of the sound that came from that beautiful um, radio in our dining room. The way my brother and I de de defined performance was the portability and the person, personality, or the person uh, sound that came out of our little, compute, our, our little radio. And we see the same thing in online education. We in the back, we have a definition of what quality teaching and learning is. And in the new world, the quality is defined by very different reasons which is a reason why I think specializations and creditation and so on are so important for us. I think that the competing against non-consumption has extraordinary opportunity for us. Now, I'm a researcher, um, and I thought I would describe an attempt that we're making to compete against non-consumption in research. So over the last year or so, I've been developing a new theory of economic growth. I got frustrated a little bit with economists because they 
orbit around the world at very high altitudes, and uh, they have models of economies, but they just can't see with much clarity what goes on inside of companies. And so we're trying to build a new model of economic growth from inside of companies. And so I wrote an uh, article about this that was published in the New York Times. It was just laid out the, the uh, bare essentials of it. We have kept track of all of my graduating, graduating students from my course. There are about 4,000 of them now. And so we send out an email to all of them saying, Clay needs your help. He's written a paper that we're sure is not very good, <laughs> but he's trying to develop a better theory of, of, of uh, growth. And I wondered if you could help us. And so these are people who are very smart people. They knew the best of my theories. They're out using my theories. And I said, if you're interested, could you just let us know, and we'll send you a copy of this early draft, and we'd like to get your inputs on how to make it better. So 1,500 came back saying, we would love to help you, Clay. And so we sent out the letter, or the, the, the rough draft, and of course a lot of them were busy and couldn't ever get around to it, but 150 sent back uh, reactions to what I said. And they were, they were just brutal, uh, but very insightful. And others were very constructive. And it turns out that 150 people, some of the smartest people in the world, who have been out there wrestling with the problems of growth in their companies, just were delighted to help me. And so we've, we tried to import, put all of their good ideas into a second draft and put it out again and <laughs> they come back with even more insight to the point that we almost had to shut the, the faucet off because there was so much insight amongst all of them that tr the traditional mode of training or of re research at a university is to close the door and figure it out ourselves. Here we open the door, and oh my gosh, unbelievable insight that they have developed. And so this article is going to come out in May or June as the lead article of the Harvard Business Review. And for the first time, I think, in history, the, the byline will be, this is written by the alumni of the BSSE course at the Harvard Business School, Harvard Business School orchestrated by Clay Christensen. And I just think that model of enabling people who previously couldn't do research because nobody would ask them for their expertise, now they can come together. And I think in field after field, the opportunity of virtual uh, interaction uh, with people that we would not have considered as, as research associates um, it makes, makes the world, it makes me very excited uh, uh, for the world. A couple of points. I mentioned that the metric of performance changes. Another important one is that the customers are sucked out of the middle into the periphery. It's, nearly, it's never the case that the technology goes back into the, into the prior one. I'm going to, OK. In the past, trade-offs have been binding. That is, if you wanted to have higher quality, it requires higher cost. But disruption almost always breaks the trade-off. And I'll talk a, a bit with how, how it does that but you can have higher quality and lower costs. <coughs> There's a, a hybrid theory that I thought would be useful here. Um, almost always the new technology isn't good enough for mainstream uh, competition. And companies that try to deploy 
the new technology in head-on competition with the old technology spend a lot of money, like the vacuum tube companies, and then they lose. And you see the very same thing happening in the, in the war that electric cars have with gasoline cars. Real competition competing against non-consumption would occur when uh, some marketer asks a question. Is there a market out there that would love to have a car that won't go far or go fast? Because the technology is such that electric cars can't go very far or go very fast. And the question is, are there markets that would love a pro product like that? And the answer without much thinking is, oh my gosh, the parents of teenagers in suburbia <laughs> would love to have a little car that their kids could use to tool around the community, go to, go to school, go see their friends, come home, plug it in overnight, and little by little, and, and the customers would love a simple product because it's infinitely better than nothing. And it really wouldn't be a car, it would be a uh, enclosed music box or something. <laughs> but then it would get better and better and better and the parents would borrow the car to do more sophisticated problems. And that's what the theory says, um, how uh, electric cars would be used. And in fact, that's what's been happening when online learning, it's competing against non-consumption at the beginning. If you try to use the technology to compete head-on with gasoline cars on the California freeway. It takes a lot of money to stretch the technologies that it can go far and go fast. And so if you have a lot of money, you can, you can buy a, tes a Tesla. But the way you do it, if you want to use the new technology in the core market, is you have a, a hybrid. And it uses the best, of the, use, the best of the old and the best of the new. And for most of us, the traditional universities, that's how we're using HBSX and so on, is to allow us to do better the way we've always done everything. And, uh, and it's the right approach, but in the end, it will kill us. Because in the end, almost always, the disruptive pure play, uh, which is online learning, will win. Because the, the, pro the technological progress outstrips the ability of customers to use the progress. And when we look at the way online learning competes with how we do it now, on a static sense, it's not as good as what we do. But on a dynamic sense, we just have to re remember the, the, pro, the process or the, the, the trajectory of technological progress outstrips the ability of customers to use the progress. I wanted to talk a little bit what the theory says about um, globalization. Typically, in the core, the architecture of the products or services are closed and proprietary. And the reason why is in the early years, you can't really make the, the definitions by which the components fit together. You can't standardize how things fit together. And so um, the architecture is interdependent and closed. You change one of the components, you have to change all of the other components because the architecture is just new. And if you try to standardize how things put together too early, it won't perform as well. The other, but over time, as the technology becomes more and more understood, it becomes more modular and open. And so the technology in what we had there is the, the peapod, the little car, the components just fit together in standard ways, whereas in the core, you can't fit things together because of the interdependence of the architecture. And so a key element why the disruptive innovation wins is because 
costs are driven down by modularity and the standardization of things. And you go back in the history of computing, you certainly saw that. Uh, in the early computers, an IBM mainframe computer comprised of 10,000 components. And the individual components didn't really drove the performance of the computer. It was the art artistry by which the engineers fit all of these pieces together. That's, def def that's where they defined the performance. But as the personal computer emerged, its architecture became very, very, very modular. And so you can, as Dell did, just get the customers to say, I want two of those and one of these, and you can mix and match and plug and play to give every customer what they needed. And you see the same thing going on in higher education today. Historically, uh, the architecture of our curricula has been very interdependent. So at the Harvard Business School, you can't study marketing if you don't study operations. You can't study operations if you don't study new product development. You can't study new product development if you don't study uh, organization design. You can't study that if you don't st st uh, s study uh, accounting. There are so many things that affect everything that management is this, this, this big uh, earth uh, hairball. And you have to teach all of it in order to teach any of it. And, and that's the way we're architected. And most universities, in one way or another, are big hairballs. <laughs> but when modularity comes in, how things fit together become very clear. And that's a, a big reason why costs go down. It's because the overhead cost of coordinating the interdependencies uh, disappears. And so in the personal computer, we don't really care whether the computer was sold by Dell or Compaq or Hewlett Packard or Lenovo, because what really drives it are the components inside, the Intel inside and the Microsoft on the screen. And that's what drives globalization in our world, is very quickly, the architecture of the curricula in most of our universities online are becoming modular. And we know how to fit the pieces together. They're standards. And you can change one thing without changing every, everything else. And therefore, the components, and the components are courses, become global in scale. And as a consequence, it makes us really quite easy for innovations in one part of the world to make their way to another part of the world. Let me just describe a little bit more about what I think is in store for us unless we try to play in the game of globalization. So I got a call a couple of years ago from the person who's responsible for uh, business uh, students at the University of Phoenix. And he said, basically, Clay, look, I've read your junk. We've watched you on YouTube. Um, we, wanna, we want to record eight or 10 of your best lectures and offer them to our students. And at this point, Harvard didn't have a policy on this. And so I tried to get an opinion, but we didn't have a poli policy. So the dean said, look, Clay, their customers aren't our customers. If you want to do this for the University of Phoenix, just go ahead. And uh, for me, it was a chance of a lifetime because my perspective is that the low end always wins. So uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't record this at Harvard because we have standards. And uh, so they went downtown to the Institute for Contemporary Art and, uh, and, and engaged to do this in a big auditorium where behind me was a beautiful a window that you could see the whole of Boston Harbor. It really was a lovely place. And uh, they promised that they'd have students there so I wasn't uh, teaching to an a empty room. Anyway, so I showed up my usual five minutes ahead and was getting the PowerPoint up. And then I looked up at the crowd. Oh my gosh, these were beautiful people. <laughs> Truly, they're beautiful people. 
And so I went up to ask one of them, oh, what school do you guys go to? And he said, oh, we're not students, we're models. <laughs> and I figured out exactly why they had models up there, because they'd watch clay. And clay sometimes is uh, engaging, sometimes is boring. And when he becomes boring, they have to pan the audience. <laughs> And they, they pretend as actors that this is interesting, you know? And then if Clay picks it up again, they focus back on Clay. And I mean, you know how the game is. So anyway, I did my best. About uh, three weeks later, the dean called me up and he said, have you ever listened to Clay Christensen give a talk? And I said, actually, no. How did he do? Clay is unbelievable. Can I show you? So he came to my office and put his laptop up, and holy cow, Clay Christensen is an unbelievable teacher. <laughs> he doesn't have any ums or ahs, or, you know, because they all had gotten edited out. He does, he, he's not boring. He, he teaches with energy. And there was music in the background when he teaches. <laughs> And when the mini mills go up and hit the integrated steel mills out of the ballpark, the, the music came to a crescendo as one got disrupted by another. <laughs> Clay is great. <laughs> and then I said, are you going to show this to many of your people? And he said, oh, of course. How many? He said, well, I think we'll show it to all 135,000 of our full-time MBA students. And I said, oh. I mean, like, Harvard admits 900 every year, and I thought we were pretty big. And he said, yeah, I know. There used to be a, a term in, Engl in the business language that was called scale. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> and then I realized, oh my gosh. There the, there's just no way that somebody of our scale could compete with that scale. But what an opportunity. You know, if Clay is really a good teacher, what a waste it would be to have Clay just limit this to access by 900 students a year. And wouldn't it be better if we just made it available for everybody and the scale brings the uh, cost uh, coming down? Just one last thing I wanted to say. Why do we care? that education be, be, why would we worry that people outside of our purview have access to the best technology and the best learning that money could buy? And I, this is the way I think about it. What this simple theory of growth entails is there are two vectors that collide, collide. and one vector is a technology that enables, that drives prices down. And then the other trajectory or vector is a sense of how much unemployment there is. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. A sense for how much non consumption there is in the market. And for those things to collide, somebody has to see both of them at once. So, for example, in the 19, or 1850s and 60s, entrepreneurs realized that if they could just, there's a lot of non-consumption of travel because the only way to do it was in a stagecoach. And as ra railroads were emerging, you could get people from here to there at much lower cost because there was all of this non-consumption of travel because it was just too costly. At the same time that insight was emerging, Bessemer developed his furnace that reduced the cost of steel by 90%. Now, if all you had, if Bessemer hadn't done his job, the railroads would have been able to continue to sell seats at very high prices. And Bessemer, if there hadn't been non-consumption, Bessemer couldn't have driven the, the, the cost of steel down. So you had to have a technological driver of cost down, 
and a sense that there is all this non-consumption. And they fed each other and just transformed the world. And it created all kinds of employment. Um, in a similar way, Henry Ford developed the Model T, which was a, um, a, a, innova a disruptive innovation, making it possible for many more people to own a car. But the product wouldn't have, the, the cost of the car wouldn't have gone down were it not for the assembly line technology that Henry Ford developed. And um, without one, you can't have the other. And what I think online learning will do in the emerging world is these are the intersections where economic growth is created. When a technology drives prices down and an entrepreneur realizes there is a lot of non-consumption in our markets, and as they develop new products that compete against non-consumption, that's where growth comes from. That's, how, that's why Japan became a prosperous country, competing against non-consumption. That's how Korea and Taiwan became prosperous, as their products competed against non-consumption. That's how China becomes prosperous. And that's one of my greatest hopes, is that globalization will enable people a sense of the technology and the market, the, the eyes for, seen, for, for seeing non-consumption and solve that problem because we make education available to everybody. God bless you. You're at the front line. Thank you very much.